Good day, everyone across North America. This is John Garmendi with Sony's Professional Solutions of America, welcoming you back to another in our series of Tech Tuesday webinars. For those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. And for those of you who have been tuning into this series since early 2020, we'd like to welcome you back. As you know, we developed these webinars so that our customers, resellers, integrators, and consultants can stay informed and up to date on Sony's latest products and solutions, especially during this past year, while many of us were not able to meet in person. Today's webinar, the second in a three-part series entitled Reawakening Student Engagement, will take a look at some of the current technology trends in education and explore some of the hybrid, and online learning solutions that make lessons more engaging and enable better student outcomes and support of educators. Before we start, a few items of housekeeping. As in all of our webinars, there'll be an opportunity for Q&A. So please submit your questions via the in-event uh, meeting question panel. We'll post links to information referred to during the webinar in the chat panel and we'll also post a link to our YouTube playlist where you can view all of our Archive Tech Tuesday webinars. Joining me today will be Chrissy Sarah, Senior Sales Support Engineer for Sony's Central Zone. I'll turn it over to Chrissy and join you back here later for Q&A. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on this great conversation. I am thrilled to offer the uh, part two version of our hybrid education experiences with our Sony products um, uh, discussion. So this is going to be a great hour together. Uh, as John mentioned, if you guys have questions about what I'm talking about, or if you have a comment, I do ask for some uh, audience participation. So if you do have a comment about something I'm chatting about, I'd love to hear about it in the questions panel. Also, uh, part of today is going to be a little bit of a review for our uh, part one, in case you missed it. And then I'm going to speak on part two. And then we do have one last um, date together later in March. So I'm looking forward to that. And I'm ready for our slide deck when you are ready for it. So as for our agenda today, um, we are discussing, of course, uh, what you see here, as well as the types of classrooms. I find a lot of times when I have my discussions in the back of our um, behind the scenes in our conversations, brainstorming and deciding how we're going to develop uh, solutions for what our customer base needs is the terminology we use. So the different types of classrooms and what they're called also in these hybrid flex environments, utilizing our um, PTZ cameras and our uh, beamforming microphone applications and different product points, what all of that together creates as some upcoming pain points. Like for instance, um, coming into a pre-existing install with some older infrastructure, or maybe the learning curve for some of the existing staff going into these new hybrid rooms. What do they do? What buttons do they press? How do they actually apply that to their teaching? And then of course, uh, we're gonna spend some, a little dedicated time speaking about our product line and how that plays into those types of classroom environments that we're going to cover. For our part three, what I'm looking forward to is kind of joining together all of these webinar concepts and um, driving home some case study points of our, our products that have been installed in higher education environments, what those look like now, what some of the production uh, pain points um, ca that came up, what the client ended up doing to solve them, how they used our products to do that, and then also some brainstorming ideas. I'm going to uh, include my glorious whiteboard that I love to teach on, and we're going to kind of uh, dash out some ideas, you know, do some napkin drawings together. So definitely stay tuned for part three. And let's go ahead and dive into our first slide of the day, which is to, again, review part one. So part one, we talked a couple weeks ago about uh, education being our number one goal, right? So 
to better understand how we can help our clients accomplish the now inevitable hybrid scenario is to first look at their actual training ground and what they're actually trying to achieve. Um, in doing so, we've learned how the students obtain information one way, the teachers deliver one way, sometimes that's different from each other. And then also we can't forget the needs of the content being presented. You know, it's not always going to be a instructor presenting a PowerPoint or instructor presenting a lab um, exercise. It could be a menagerie of things. And especially in these environments, I've seen some really great uh, examples of design thinking in play where they're bringing in completely different ways how to teach something. Um, so lots of ways that we can assess the need of the education client here with thinking not just of the students, not just of the teachers, but also of the actual content that needs to be addressed. So that's something to keep in mind. We also learned in our education goal about the uh, actual terminology of those learning styles. So the kinesthetic, the audible, the visual, the ambidextrous version of learning, and also the teaching. Um, last but not least, you know, we've always seen those 102, 101, 102, 103 versions of classes. Well, that also then changes the need as well. I, for some reason, I always go back in my mind to a science class in high school where I had lecture and then we went into the dissection of whatever, the worms and the cats and whatever. And the 101 version was all book work. 102 version was applying what we learned from book. And then 103 was the testing and the, the verifying what we learned. So that's an example of what I mean by 101, 102, and 103. So um, the other thing that I wanted to point out about review of part one is our delivery being our goal number two. We as AV technicians are so used to, and I hate to use the word jaded, but we're just so used to presentation options that we forget that putting an instructor on camera is brand new to that instructor. They are not used to being on camera. They don't even understand why they need to be on camera. And there's a lot of things to talk about when we're trying to educate the end user into understanding why they even need this AV solution and what hybrid means to them. So um, before we move to that hybrid idea, again, we talked about how the goals still remain the same, right? The professor and the student still want to be heard, seen. They want to be able to deliver and receive the content that's being presented properly. And that's going to look different for everyone that's involved. So getting to the bottom of what that looks like to them is key to understanding how we can provide those AV solutions in a delivery um, that's going to, to be successful to them. Um, we also talked about ideation, so how to actually do that. Um, definitely brainstorming the possibilities and applying those budget guidelines. I was doing some industry research this week about budget guidelines, and it's definitely um, still there, you know, that, that better best and or good, better, best option, what the most ideal, usually most expensive version is, and then going one step down from that and one step down for that. And sometimes providing that to the customer is simply what you need just to get the idea started, right? Just to brainstorm what will be eventually the final, um, the final uh, solution created for them. And something I thought about uh, once I was building this deck for our presentation today was once we understand all that in the ideation process, then we finally get to start looking at gear. And that is what today is. So I'm excited. <laughs> uh, last but not least about part one was the production value. And I hope, and I'm really looking forward to somebody, I really hope at least one person from part one watched a movie without audio and then watched a movie without actually watching it with just the audio and did that brain homework. I really hope somebody says in the chat that they did that. If you also want to say in the chat that that's a dumb idea, feel free to say that too. I'm open to all perspectives. But if you did do that homework from part one, please tell me uh, in the questions what, how you felt about that and if you did benefit from that exercise. So now that we have the review of part one out of the way, let's dive into part two. And our first section of our conversation is to definitely review the terms that we hear 
every day and that we read about in our um, different th different sources that we all reach out to to find information for, right? So we talk to other AV tech managers, we review our social medias of different uh, networks that we're connected to, all the industry standard places that are around telling us what we should and shouldn't be using, and of course the latest technologies. So in that then is our first term of the day, which is um, our traditional in-person classrooms, the ones we're all used to, our virtual, which means having a, per a virtually present teacher while students are present virtually. So a lot of um, the difference though that we're gonna get into is the difference between the term virtual versus online and how that is different and how that means for us in person with AV gear versus them at their homes. Hybrid, flex, flipped, high flex, labs, incubators, teaching theaters. If you have heard of another term that I don't have listed, please put it in the questions. I'd love to talk about that. Um, I also would like to hear, these are of course the, the definitions that I have developed over my years in this uh, EDU environment. If this is something that you've heard differently, please uh, I would love to, to hear it from you. So my version of traditional classroom environment definition is a physical classroom with an in-person presenting teacher and an in-person present student body. So that usually means then it's furnished with either desks or chairs or tables with chairs. And then for, uh, AV presentation gear is typically all fixed, right? So you walk into a classroom, there is a presentation space in the in the front, and then there is learning spaces, or I or should say learning tables in the audience for them to then look at the presenter and learn about whatever they're learning about. So traditional classroom environment that we're all pretty used to in a standard way. Next would be a virtual classroom environment. So that same idea or, or or theory, but we have a type of classroom environment where the teacher and the students are present online together for a virtually live class. So the difference there, again, virtual versus online. So online can be de defined as something that's already been taught and they go back to review it, or something that has zero live portions and is just an online class where they review their own syllabus, they do their own homework, they might have email conversation with their instructor, but there's no live teaching portion, which is what would be present in a virtual space. So when I was teaching some of the CTS courses, um, especially the CTS prep course, when I was doing that virtually, I was present virtually, my student body was present virtually, and we discussed class together, we had hours together teaching, and then they would go home and do their online homework. So um, versions of this could be recorded, again, meaning not live, where it was, there's a self-paced curriculum version, which I just mentioned, or live presentation along with self-paced curriculum, lots of mix there. And of course, each of those scenarios could be required of different AV solutions on both ends, right? Next, we have our um, hybrid class environment. This is something that's new and exciting and very exciting to me, um, especially now with the last two years and this, the state of our society, it's definitely become way more of an important uh, version. Now, hybrid has been around, definitely. I've been in a few hybrid courses you know, prior to, to this, these past two years but uh, it's now becoming the norm in my opinion. So having an in-person presenting teacher in a, physical, in a physical classroom while the students are present both in person and virtually. If you guys have ever taught anybody anything, even if it's an at home teaching your kids how to cook food, Imagine trying to teach one person present in the kitchen and then trying to teach that same person, or sorry, a different person, same lesson, but they're on FaceTime or they're on a, a device where they're not present in your own kitchen. A great way to put yourself in your end user's shoes, no pun intended, is to grab somebody that you have around you and seat them in a chair just like this, and then they're behind you 
and you have a shoe in your hand and they have a shoe in their hand and you have to describe using your um, language how to tie a shoe and their goal is to not do the, the, sh the shoe tying themselves. They have to listen to the words coming out of your mouth. And that is a great way to put yourself in a, um, put yourself in their shoes of understanding the difficulty behind teaching and speaking over without being able to show them something physically, an audible lesson on how to do the thing. So if that's something that would help you uh, to understand where we're at at this, what we're trying to ac accomplish psychologically with a hybrid classroom environment and how we're going to apply our Sony products to do so. Um, so uh, just to describe a couple of these mixes, you know, this could mean that the teacher's live audio, live video, and live content needs to all be accessible via online while they're teaching it, or simply what's being recorded live, meaning the content that's happening in the classroom, is then also available online. So definitely uh, a lot that can be said for a hybrid classroom environment. So a flex classroom environment is pretty nifty. I probably would have had a lot better takeaways in college myself if I was in flex environments. Uh, so I'm really excited this is becoming more normal. And a flex classroom environment in my uh, research and definition is a physical classroom where furnishings and presentation hardware is movable and able to accommodate several variations of learning and teaching. Um, I would love to hear from some of the audience what they have seen as far as what a, a flex classroom looks like in real life. There's many different versions. I was going to add a picture in here of the flex classroom environments, but there's so many and they can look so different that I'd love to hear from you guys what those would look like to you. And then tune in for part three and we're gonna look at some actual case studies with actual classrooms where our Sony products are installed and you'll see uh, some of what our customers are doing. So flex rooms really provide, I got this information by the way of, of this official definition here that I'm gonna mention from the state of California's Department of Education white paper on best practices for flex classroom environments. And the flexible schools provide the space outside the classroom for collaborative learning, such as learning studios with a lot of daylight, flexible furniture, space for group projects. Um, they could create a mock environment of the real world, and then the students come in and do whatever they're learning in that space. And uh, there's, there's a lot more in that definition, but you get my point is it's just meant to be a collaborative area. And that also then means that AV-wise, we're talking about movable displays, movable carts with presentation cameras and streaming devices. Uh, where is, how are we getting our, are we using Wi-Fi, are we using Bluetooth, and how are we getting that to the hybrid students that are attending virtually, and so on. All right, next uh, definition here is marrying the two. So we have now a high flex classroom environment. We can't already be more complicated in what we're trying to accomplish in the space we're trying to accomplish it in, we're going to mix the two. And that is where a teacher is instructing both in person and virtually in a classroom environment that promotes this flexible furnishing and flexible presentation options. So pointing out that any classroom environment can technically be considered a learning, a flexible learning space. Again, we're delineating the two Flexible is where things are moving around inside the space. And then hybrid is where you have people present both virtually and in person. Um, so technically with the, with the idea of hybrid, whatever, like high flex, high diet flipped, you, the hybrid part is when you have people present in person and virtually, and then you can just apply whatever the other environment is. High flex though is a buzzword, so I have to talk about it. And that's basically what we're talking about here in our industry is that we're dealing with hybrid, virtual and in-person, and then the classroom itself is interchangeable. Therefore, our AV gear has to be interchangeable. Okay, so let's move on to our next uh, term. We have just a handful more, about halfway there, and then we'll get into some of our 
our products and how that works together. So flipped classroom is actually new to me. Um, I've been a student in a flipped environment, but I didn't know that I was being a student in a flipped environment until this part of my career. So a flipped classroom, in case you've never heard of it before, consists of students completing direct instruction, such as viewing a lecture online prior to the in-class discussion of the material. The intent is for the students to see the material beforehand, also known as first exposure learning, so they can learn the concepts at their own pace. Credit to study.com for that definition. So a flipped classroom is pretty unique and you have to ask the end user what, what their expectation is for the in-person part of that um, delivery technique. And I'm definitely interested in uh, seeing what some of those are in real life. I have seen it through our case studies, but not physically present there. So I'm looking forward to that. All right, lab classroom, one of my favorites because I'm a kinesthetic learner myself, is a type of classroom environment where students are conducting hands-on experiments using objects associated with the topic at hand, typically furnished with individual tables and educational objects assigned to each space. So going back to my science uh, class in high school, you know, we had lab tables with all sorts of fun things to do to learn um, a uh how to do a comp physically accomplish the thing another thing might be like mechanic class where you're learning how to take apart an engine um so uh that is how we how do we put that on a uh, screen how do we how do we put that in um a, a hybrid environment a comment in the questions panel is our Hybrid courses at Auburn have been going on since 1987. We did not have an online live version until 2008. <laughs> Perfect. So that's really cool to see. I'd love to hear from more of you of um, what the, uh, or from you about how that has changed. You know, if hybrid courses have been going on for that long, what did that change into now um, with the 2008 changeover and then now in 2022? how the how that looks now that would be really cool to hear from you um for moving into our next version of um class uh environment is incubators and i always get stuck on this one because i have chickens on my farm and we use incubators to help the chicks hatch and i didn't understand how to apply that to education so I, I had to dig for this one for you guys, and I'm pretty excited with, 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 with what I found, a type of educational program where students expect to learn, apply, ideate, and troubleshoot scenarios related to the specific topic. So it's, a, it's, it's almost like a specific lab, um, and that is a niche for some product. My first thought is, Cameras with dark cap uh, capability to still show beautiful resolution in dark spaces. Um, I also thought about maybe a cooking class where you're maybe that could be considered an incubator versus a lab where you have students designated to a niche uh, course material where you have to have cameras shooting down at the table, uh, side view of the um, uh, what the the I almost said presenter chef is doing in the pan so that's that's that adds some interesting thoughts to what we would need to do with uh with some av gear and then also obviously if we're having multiple cameras in a cooking cooking class we're going to need something to switch so uh thank you indeed.com for that definition of incubator classroom environments and um Last but not least, and then we'll finally get into some of the exciting gear conversation is teaching theaters. I've been in some of these myself too, very cool spaces. They remind me a little bit about black box theaters. If any of you have ever had to create AV solutions for theatrical environments, low light, intimate audience, um, definitely unique. It's not your typical auditorium where you go into a large lecture space with 300 students and you have a presenter is, you know, super tiny down, down at the front of the classroom. Um, it's, uh, it's not your traditional space. So, so to, for those that have not heard of a teaching theater, it's in its own name, a teaching theater classroom environment is a smaller auditorium consisting of audience style seating 
with a small stage space but with dedicated AV equipment to be used in that combined manner. So it can be a traditional theater style seating, or it might be a little bit more collaborative to be like kind of airport loungy vibe. If you guys have been in a waiting period before your gate, or if you've gone to some of the airport lounges, there's kind of little sections, maybe of like two or three seats. You can still see the main display, which is the, um, you know, where all the flights are, or in this example, it would be, you know, where the teacher's presenting. And it's just, you know, grab a coffee, listen kind of thing. Um, pretty, pretty awesome. And in my broadcast, this, this kind of like twinges my broadcast uh, nerve because it's like, yeah, this would, be, this would be really cool. It's basically like a small show that you're doing in a dedicated space with a small uh, audience. So another comment um, in the chat that I, or the questions panel that I noticed was that the equipment changes have been great. This is going back to that, that uh, Auburn example is the equipment changes have been great and uh, our Sony products have made a big impact. Definitely looking forward to hearing more about what that, what that looks like for you. And the main changes have been that instantaneous access to classes worldwide. That's a big ROI changer, isn't it? And professors having two-way conversations with students at a distance. Uh, which in real time, so along, just as if the virtual student raises their hand and says, hey, I have a question, so-and-so, that audio from that student is being heard throughout the classroom. So definitely very good input. Thank you for that. All right. Um, some of the pain points I promised that I would talk about uh, that I have heard in conversation, and I'm sure there's many more, is first and foremost, going virtual, just the whole idea <laughs> of going virtual. Also, does that going virtual have to include interactivity? Um, is it going to be live or recorded? The production quality and value of what's taking place inside the classroom and also the production quality and value of what this, the virtual audience is experiencing. And then the, the production quality and value of what that student is being able to deliver back to the teacher who's present or vice versa. So another uh, pain point here is unique subject matters. Um, there was a university, which I'll talk more about this in part three, that was using our edge device in a very cool way. And they were able to provide a finals, meaning a, a testing finals presentation space using our edge for all for many majors, not just one. Uh, Another pain point here is university existing network infrastructure supporting new bandwidth requirements. Whew, <laughs> we could spend a whole hour talking about that. And then at the end of the day, with all of these pain points present and some of the others I'm, I'm interested to hear from the audience is, are we still meeting our end goals, right? What, what uh, roadblocks have we had to navigate? Where are we at with actually still accomplishing our goals from part one? So what I would say is first up with going virtual is how do we take what has always been present in person and putting it online? Uh, some of the education technical forums that are floating around have really good perspectives um, about what some of our fellow AV tech managers in the education space have done. One of the things that we're gonna hit on right after this slide is dealing with it, it, in what I've seen, the, the, the biggest pain point is the learning curve for the instructors. Um, and if that's not your biggest pain point, I want to know what your biggest pain point typically is. So obviously, there's a learning curve with a, an instructor coming into the classroom, pressing play, and what does that do and what is now required of them, and then dealing with the psychological aspect of that change as well. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But once we're virtual, are we interacting with the virtual audience? Does the teacher need to see the virtual students? Do the virtual students need to see the in-person students? How much interactivity are we needing? What I have seen is that interactivity has to happen, but what to what capacity does the budget allow? What capacity does the, um, does the, uh, I just lost my train of thought because I started thinking about something else. Let me go back. Boop. Dip, 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 dip. Interactivity and the amount of levels that the budget will allow 
and what the space will allow. So if I have, um, you know, a smaller theater space, can you even have interactivity with that? I don't, we don't know. We have to verify that. Um, okay, so being live or recorded for later review, I would say at least 85% of the conversations I have with our clients involve live and recorded. Um, some pain points involving that is not only the quality of what's being recorded, because we all know that signal type changes when it's being live and just allowed live versus being recorded. But also, once we do get that recorded, where is all that data now being stored? You're having hours of education being live, then recorded, and now stored, having to be accessed online later. How are you handling that? Um, how do we light, capture, and receive audio from a moving teacher? So all instructors, if you have one teaching space, let's just go simple here for a second. If you have one teaching space, one instructor comes in, teach it, you know, the, the space is open and booked for class all day long, eight hours of teaching, eight different instructors. How do you how do you provide the same level of production quality for everybody involved on the receiving end of this and for the teacher involved in doing the presentation and the, the education part? How do you keep that standard when you have eight different versions of teaching? Um, when I was in live events, I was a camera operator and I was usually, for whatever reason, I was the most steady. So I was always the main camera operator. And something that that experience gave me, which really gives me a lot of perspective for what I do today is anytime you have, you're on cameras on sticks, is the presenter can be somebody who walks across stage in a nice, slow, nice, regular cadence where you have them in view in the camera. And then you have somebody who's got ADD and they're very excited about whatever they're teaching and they, they, they fly around the stage, you know, bounce from one end to the other. They get really excited and crunch down and they jump up really high. What's, as a live presenter or a live camera stick operator, I can definitely move and capture all that, but how are you gonna handle that with a automated PTZ camera? Um, without a person there. You can't be there live. You have 85 other classrooms to attend to. How do we manage that uh, with a camera installation and framing and all that? So uh, definitely a pain point there in making sure to, to maintain the same quality of education or uh, of, of broadcast production while having many different types of presenters. Okay, last but not least um, is the students uh, receiving that same type of quality. So um, I don't know how frustrating it is. If anybody else is a teacher on here or has heard this from other teachers is they're spending all this time and energy creating their lesson to present in this hybrid to them complex uh, new format. And their students' cameras are like, you know, they're seeing this much of their face and it's foggy and like they're it clearly looks like they're they're laying in bed like half tuned in to whatever's happening and that's you know yes it's student engagement but it's how can we or you set a standard for the students interactivity and what they're showing on their camera you know bus shot um type deal um, proper lighting, engagement, ready with a notepad, whatever that is. Um, I have seen one, I think it was possibly this past week, it possibly was Texas A&M, I'm not sure exactly who it was, but they actually had like a recommended list for people who want to be on camera for, for their teachers and say, you know, recommended audio, make sure microphone placement, camera placement, um, content placement, et cetera. I thought that was pretty neat, but anyways, getting off track, how do we standardize students' virtual participation and quality? Uh, definitely up for conversation. And I might go ahead and put some of these questions out on the Twitterverse to see some more of your responses, um, just to you know help each other out and find, our, find solutions to these pain points. One last big one that is worth a whole slide of itself is ways to combat decline in teaching efficiency and transferring of that knowledge. Um, 
we already, as you can already figure out with my way of communicating is that I apply the technical side and the solutions available along with the psychological side of what our customers are experiencing, right? It's not all about just selling something. It's about giving our clients what they need to accomplish their goals and helping them find that solution for what they need. So to dive into this a little bit um, is past versus present. And I'm just going to let you, uh, I'm going to let you guys read this slide a little bit here before I talk all over it, because I'm going to talk different about what's on the slide. All right. Hopefully you were able to read that. That's the five second broadcast rule it is five seconds per line of text. So hopefully everybody was able to uh, read what I wrote there. So for the sake of our time today, I'm going to stick with going hybrid um, in any classroom environment. So I'm not going to speak to all the other classroom types that we mentioned already. I'm going to stick solely with a hybrid. So there's lots of pros and cons to in-person education from the get-go. Really, the present reality of going hybrid is a welcomed change as we all have. I mean, if you be honest with yourself, you would do like what you're doing. You do like coming up with these hybrid environments <laughs> for your for your university that you believe in because you work there. So you obviously enjoy some of that. And it is a welcome change to create this for your uh, for your end users. Um, but as we all know, with any change, there's always going to be road bumps. And this next road bump here is getting these teachers to maintain their level of effic efficiency uh, with this new format and this new platform. Um, I actually don't even know, to be honest, and this would be getting nerdy as far as education goes, how to measure that, uh, that's that's outside of my wheelhouse. But for me as a teacher, I can put my own teaching shoes on and know that I, that I kind of measure my efficiency with student feedback. I always ask the students back, hey, give me three takeaways that you're gonna, that you learned in this class. Um, I, I took a professional development class last week, two days long. And that was something I asked myself after the class was, if I learned any three things, was it worth my money? Was it worth my time? And that's how I measure, but that's just a personal thing. I don't know how that happens on a grand scale of education. So I'd love to hear from somebody on that. But let's dive into a thought here. So all teachers teach differently. We get that some more archaic than others. I, I know I teach some of my if you start getting me talking about light and physics, forget it. I'm going to go like forget all the things we're even supposed to talk about. And I'm going to dive right into that. And believe it or not, I like to use paper and markers. I am still in the paper marker marker world of teaching. Um, I use a whiteboard every single day. And um, I even really enjoy document cameras, which is that's not technically archaic because that's still being used today. But like if you guys remember, um, I think 20 years ago or 30 years ago, the overhead projectors and how big they were, and they were on the rolly carts, like we're definitely past that. But unfortunately, it's still present just as VGA is. So Going back to my original point that some teachers are just stuck in their ways of teaching for 40 years, and that's that. And that's what you have to figure out how to apply this hybrid version of teaching in to them. And what I have to say to that, hands down, is you have to have train the trainer sessions. So imagine this. You just completely reinvented their working space, and they're not going to be happy with that. They are, might not even be open to train their training sessions, but as you as an AV tech manager and, and somebody who's looking to reinvent space for them, you must conduct those train the trainer sessions, get your teaching staff trained on the new system, set the standard, and then after, even if they don't even attend, if you've created those trainings and after all that, they still can't find the on button, you've done your part. You have accomplished your goal of creating a, 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 a awesome 
AV solution for them to address their students in a hybrid environment. You have uh, b um, met them at their, their level as far as understanding how to operate the system. You've taught them the best ways to look good and all that stuff. You've given them the tools to continue their on with their teaching. If they don't want to take that to their teaching uh, the tool house, that's on them. But regardless, I definitely recommend train the trainer sessions. Um, definitely, if you haven't already, learn from them. Feel free to create a survey to learn from your teaching staff what their needs are, uh, what their expectations are, what they consider a win as far as a good day in class. Uh, we all have good days and bad days. What does that look like for them? And then uh, you'll be able to better a, a design the needed solution for them because you are actually hearing it from them. So, you know, sending a survey out to your teachers to find out how they actually do their job is not um, not unheard of and it would probably be welcomed at least to half of your staff. Once you learn how they think and how they're going to teach, you can weigh the differences with what a AV gear is available on the market. And then you can start specking in and bridge that gap. Um, and then last but not least, <laughs> this makes me laugh, help those stuck in 1999 overhead projector land to see the new light. Show them how utilizing a digital whiteboard is better for information absorption. So get a student in there and say, this is why I love this technology, please use this more. Make them a student of their own gear, plan to use, um, you know, so that they can see how the information is intended, not just, hey, this is your new whiteboard. Um, all, last but not least, if you're unable to, is uh, do a survey of the students, you know, get, get a draw from the students of what um, they're trying, how they're going to learn and what they want from their teachers and help the teachers see what their students are actually saying. So anyways, I could talk a little bit longer on that, but I really want to go ahead and get into our gear for you because you did come here to learn a bit on how our Sony products meet all of these expectations. And I'm going to go ahead and dive right into that. So how does uh, the EDU AV needs meet our Sony product line? So I have um, a couple slides and I'm, I have already hounded you with production quality. So I'm not, I'm not going to even spend another minute on this other than where I'm focusing my lecture around this format, camera view, audio quality, content clarity, bandwidth, and recorded storage. So if there's elements of production quality that you think need to be added to this list, by all means, put them in our comment box or our questions thing, because um, this is what I speak out of whenever I talk on our um, Sony product line. So as you may have perused our website and uh, our fantastic marketing um, options that we have for you guys to see our products in actual spaces, definitely get a chance to look at that. Um, and some of our links are going to be in the chat as you or for the questions panel as you, as John mentioned earlier, but our higher education eco space, our B2B product line speaks directly to those hybrid and high flex learning experiences, the flipped classrooms, the small to mid sized classrooms, even those large classroom audience going back to the in between there is not really listed here, but we talked about it earlier is those teaching spaces. Um, those teachers, teaching theaters, huddle spaces, or um, the incubators. And then of course, those reception or common areas. I went, before I left, before I came here, I was at Avixa and I was teaching at different universities and I was teaching in some of these education spaces. The reception and common areas are actually a really great place to put some AV gear because it gets people conditioned to receive information from this form of of presentation right so it's not it's not all about in-person experience it's also about training your students to be able to say hey uh you're you're now going to be receiving this information via your mobile device which thankfully for everybody here social media has already been doing that for us so that's helpful let's get into our first one which is hybrid and high flex learning so we have quite a plethora of uh, options for you. We have a projector line, laser projector. We have our Pro Bravia displays, many different sizes, 32 inch being the smallest, 100 inch being the largest. Our beam forming ceiling microphone, 
our remote uh, PTZ network cameras. We both we have both the PTZ version and then we also have a box or POV version. And then we have our edge analytics space. And so um, speaking on this particularly hybrid and flex learning environments is, again, we're doing a lot here. We're going, we're having an, an in the classroom experience and a virtual experience. So how are we going to present the information in classroom? Is it going to be Bravia displays? Oh, hold on. Sorry, I'm talking to my own slide and not to your slide. So hybrid and high flex learning experience is, again, that movable space. So in this environment, we have those movable chairs, movable tables. Here in this example, the displays, I see one Bravia display and I see one projector and I see some microphones. Um, all of that is fixed, but what's flexible here is where the where they're looking, right? So they can look at the the content that's being talked to on either the right side of the room or the front part of the room. I don't know north, south, east, west, so whatever direction that is in this picture. So that would be an idea to add a high flex environment would be to add more displays. Um, all right, let's move on. I got a couple more slides before uh, we get to your questions, so we can speak more on that. But let's move on to our next version of classroom here. So flipped classroom experiences, same type of deal using our um, ingredient list, if you'd like to call that as our product portfolio is um, the laser projector here, shooting at one side of the room for the teacher to reference. But we also have environments where students can come in utilize their own their own separate display that's going to showcase maybe it's their maybe they're doing a collaborative project with their own collaborative team so maybe a hybrid breakout room where you have you know sessions where you have six student six student sessions one uh, in each student se session there's two students uh, in person, and then there's also students virtually present, and then they can see those students and interact with that group on that display. So you would also need to be able to have a microphone capacity to pick up those students in person. And then whatever the, the whether that instructor is being a facilitator or an actual presenter here, not sure, but in a flipped room, they're usually not. It's usually just a, a facilitator of some sort. So somebody that's keeping them moving along with their classroom experience as well as those um, virtually. So Bravia displays here. I also see some PTZ camera work. So possibly putting that instructor on camera for those that are hybrid. And then uh, the remote cameras point of view here could possibly be, be doable because you don't might not need to actually follow the instructor around. They might just be interested in going on camera when they're only at the front of the room. Uh, edge analytics, couple things with our edge device if you don't know much about it. It's got those five licenses and that is uh, um, Chroma Keyless CG overlay, auto PTZ tracking. We also have the um, uh, Chroma, wait, I already said that, sorry. I usually say them in a different order, so my bad the focus area cropping and close-up by gesture and one other one. So there's lots of variants for this edge analytic device. I know this picture only shows the handwriting extraction and the, oh, that was the other one, and auto tracking. But those two could be utilized here in some of these other classroom environments uh, with those feature sets to showcase whatever the teacher is trying to say. Or if this is going to be, I don't know if I have, an incubator option here, but if it's gonna be an incubator class, they could also be sharing what's these individual little cubes of what's being written on the whiteboards for the actual uh, group um, using that handwriting extraction on an edge. That would be pretty cool too. All right, I am being kicked away so that we can answer your questions. So I'm going to finish up one more environment, John, I promise. And then I'll throw it to you. I know I, I, I get excited about all this and then I run out of time. Um, Huddle Spaces is pretty cool. So 
Puddle spaces are definitely up and coming. I don't want to say up and coming. They're already here. Much more relevant, especially in if you guys have walked around airports at all recently. These little tiny spaces to do some of this collaboration. Um, so basically, like the flipped classroom environment we just talked about, those student cubicles are now instructorless, and they are just whatever the students are doing together in those spaces to huddle, right? Hey, let's go talk about this thing. Um, so a little bit of a closed environment. Not, I wouldn't say projectors would be really acceptable here, maybe um, so, some cool table projection, but not anything that's, this isn't a big space. This is meant for being able to actually be right against the display, touching it, showing where, um, where the content is, talking very intimately with the other person involved and then whoever else is virtually present. So those 32 inch, those 43, 50 inch Bravia displays would be good for this. And then obviously the ability to get online. All right, I'm going to hand it over to John for some questions. And I will finish these last three slides that we didn't get to today uh, on my Twitter so you don't have to um, miss out on those. So take it away, John. Hey, thank you, Chrissy. That was an awful lot of information to cover and I think you uh, you covered it really well uh, as judged by the, uh, the amount of um, uh, engagement that we had here in the question panel. So I'll get right to it. Um, uh, let's see. William asks for huddle spaces. Um, um, also nice, well, it's actually a comment, right? For huddle spaces, also nice to have a solution entirely contained in the flat panel display. Ooh, and, good point. Yeah. yeah. Great point, that digital signage options. Yeah. Yes, and I think that that's uh, that's important to make mention, uh, William. Just so you you know, I don't know how familiar you are with ProBravia, but we do have an onboard SOC uh, system on a chip that's Android based, allows us to uh, uh, to be able to play um, a number of uh, of um, uh, signage solutions. A number of our signage partners have um, apps that will run on the M Android uh, SOC natively. So uh, this way you don't need to have an outboard player for those signage solutions. So good point, and thanks for bringing that up. Um, uh, Julie asks if Sony has a streaming recording device for lecture capture. We don't have a recorder, but we can send, our cameras have a streaming channel, so to speak. Um, that you can utilize. Our Edge also has streaming capability, but we don't have the device that records. We do in broadcast media, but that's that's for a different type of um, recording process. So I can find a version for you that is for some of those other uh, verticals, but as far as like ingesting and then doing something with it, not so much in B2B. I think it's also um, it's also uh, maybe of interest to mention that our beamforming microphone has actually two streams, one for uh, for lecture capture a recording, and the other for uh, in room uh, speech reinforcement. Yeah, so um, that's a uh, again not a recording device, but something that plays well in into that space and uh, and complements. Uh, uh, your recording. Um, got a question from Linda. She asks about um, what's our offering on Sony camera control and how does that look on the far end? Yes. So a couple options. Let's, let's speak just to Sony and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the other op third party options available. So I've actually noticed this distinction I've had to make a couple times in the last couple months, which surprised me. So I'm just going to go ahead and say it because it's fresh in my mind. Camera control is different than camera output receive. What do I mean by that? You have in this hybrid environment, everybody's trying to make everything automated. You have two things you have to figure out how to do. Control the cameras that are present and then control the feeds that you're getting from multiple cameras, which is 
back in my day is technical directing where you have all of your camera feeds coming into a switcher and you call camera one, call camera two, and you build your program out. And the program out is what your audience is receiving. That is different than camera control because your camera control is, all right, camera one, I need you to pan left and right. Camera two, I need you to pan left and right. You get your shot and then you call your show. Those two things are two different versions of control that need to be addressed in your hybrid signal flow because that's different. Uh, you can't, it's just two different ideas entirely. Hopefully that makes sense. And so as far as what Sony has for those two options, you know, a little bit of this is broadcasty because you're receiving, you're receiving signals in over here on this video switcher. Um, what we have in B2B is camera control devices. So we have our um, RMIP 500, and we also have a smaller one, which is our R RMIP 10, which actually has buttons and a little joystick, and it's very handy. A lot of people use them. Those are our devices that we actually use to simply tell our cameras where they're where to go, where to look, where to zoom, so on. As far as a video switcher, when you have multiple camera feeds coming in and now I need to create a program out to then send to through UCC or whatever you're going to send it to recording. Um, that is outside of B2B in our media department. And that's more, more of a broadcast thing. I've also been noticing that we have people using software for that. So, so some third party options that you would be considering would be something like an OBS or um, take, you know, taking those feeds in, you're also gonna be taking in microphone feeds and then you create your program out digitally through that software, which might be an option for, for you if you're doing um, mobile carts and stuff. So, yes. Great, great. Um, let's see, in our last minute, Chrissy, uh, let's go back to William and, he, uh, he had a follow-up question with respect to the all-in-one and said he's also thinking about uh, BYOD. And maybe uh, oh, cool. we could just br briefly talk about those, uh, those features and functionality within the ProBravia. Um, yeah, so going back a little bit to our digital signage options, uh, a previous qu uh, question from or comment for about huddle spaces. So our Pro Bravia displays, which I was trying to get something up on my background cool for you guys, but I didn't think ahead, so I was rushing. But anyways, um, our Pro Bravia displays are really awesome. They have not only amazing image quality and color reproduction, but they also have the SOC and they also have Pro Mode. Pro Mode is the ability to tell the display whatever you want it to do. So if you're saying, I want to be able to wake on sync, here's how here's how that's going to work and here's also what can't change so for instance i'm going to max out the volume and nobody can come in here and change the volume um that also means that you can say that a certain application opens up as soon as somebody turns on the display you can also do power scheduling where if you know your room or your huddle space is going to be active at a certain time your pro bravia display is going to turn on it's going to auto launch an app and that's now sitting there waiting for a student to interact with it we also work with TSI Touch to do uh, touchscreen options. It's a it's an over it's a physical overlay that goes on the display, and that is um, great for options where you might need to touch around. It's basically a ten point IR, so that means that you know if they need to touch areas that are in the application, drop down menus, go to a website, whatever, um, that can all be programmable in this pro mode, and. Uh, you can trust that that display will remain locked down to whatever you're choosing through that application. Um, so BI bring your own device would be a simple plug in whatever they're, you know, have an HDMI attached to the screen, or if you are willing to have the terminals open for uh, use is, um, you know, telling the display in pro mode to listen to that, that active signal that's going to be found so that they can just bring their device, plug in the HDMI, now it brings up their laptop feed, and then if it is a touch screen, they can they can uh, use the touch to mouse all over it. Excellent, yeah. And don't forget, we also support uh, wireless connectivity um, mm -hmm. and uh, and Bluetooth. So those are two things that enable BYOD as well. Which are both items that can be turned off in Pro Mode too. So you can turn them on, turn them off, and interchangeably. There's so many options; it's hard to squeeze it in in a minute. <laughs> important. Important. 
So thank you so much, Chrissy. Like I said, we really covered a lot of territory here. Um, everyone, please don't hesitate to, uh, to come back for the third in our series. Uh, we're going to take a, uh, a break. In two weeks, we're going to have uh, our product manager, Anthony Cianferrano, come back and join us. And he's going to go over all the accessibility features, which are, again, oh, so important in the educational environment. Uh, education, um, accessibility features of uh, our ProBravia displays. So that'll be on Tuesday, March 15th, the Ides of March. And we look forward to, uh, to seeing everyone then. Thanks all for your, for your time as always. Thanks for joining us and wishing you um, a, a fantastic rest of your day. Thanks all.